And uh, I'll congratulate the introducer because I'm a great fan of Elm too. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's great to be back here in Krakow and at Lambda Days. So what I'd like to talk about is a scientific document management system. And uh, to set the stage, I am a, I guess I should call myself a recovering mathematician. Uh, I spent most of my career joyfully teaching mathematics, doing research in mathematics. And my days were filled with uh, you know, filling up blackboards and whiteboards, mostly blackboards, which I prefer with things like what you see here. Uh, you know, there are, there's text, of course, there are equations, there are figures, and all these are things that you need to be able to handle in the scientific document management system. So um, uh, how did we do this in the old days? Well, we used LaTeX, uh, a markup language. Some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may love it and some of you may hate it. But what you would do is you would write it in a text editor, then you would run a program like PDF LaTeX or maybe DVIPS or something, end up eventually with a PDF document. And uh, of course, because a uh, markup language is really a little programming language, uh, you have often syntax errors. So in addition to getting some facsimile of a PDF document, you might get a whole long list of errors, which are not necessarily pleasant to look at. And so one often finds oneself in a state like uh, what you see with this, uh, this fellow right here. Okay, so uh, these days, there must be a better way of doing that, uh, namely by some suitable web app, maybe something that looks like this. So this is uh, the current state of the project I've been working on for a while. It's actually a thing, scripta.io. You can go on the web and find it. If you care to try it out, I'd be happy to receive your bug reports and other comments. So uh, anyway, what should such a system have? Well, it first of all needs to have a searchable store of documents. So if you look at the, at the left-hand narrow window, there's some documents that have been pulled up by a search Let's see, what have I searched for? I've searched for qua mech that will match the conjunction of, or it'll bring up documents on quantum mechanics, so it's a conjunctive search. And uh, the middle pane shows the text editor. That's not necessarily open, but of course, if you're gonna write a document, it, it is. This one happens to be LaTeX, but it could be one of two other markup languages, a version of Markdown that can handle math, and my private little successor to LaTeX, which I call Enclosure. And then on the right-hand window, you see the rendered text. And one of the design requirements for uh, such a system, at least in my view, is that uh, you should be able to not only have a searchable store of documents, but with the integrated editor, text is immediately rendered when you type it. So if I change one character, that is re immediately reflected in the right-hand window, okay? And by the way, if you have instant rendering, instantaneous rendering, you also have to solve another problem, which is what I call graceful parsing, because your document will often be in an error state because there's some syntax error. You haven't closed a curly brace or something. And so you need to make note of that error uh, in the rendered text, and moreover, and perhaps most importantly, the text after the error has to be properly rendered. Otherwise, you'll be looking at garbage half the time, and who wants to do that? So I'll, I'll demonstrate that a little bit later on. Okay, now, uh, how did I get there? Well, I guess the real answer is quite slowly. Um, you know, was, I, I'd always been fascinated by computer programming. My first experience was punching cards and learning Fortran. Uh, that sort of dates me, I guess. But um, anyway, I thought when I considered this project, I've done some programming, I can do this. I, of course, learned that software development is quite different than making one-off programs to solve some particular problem. And so my first attempt was uh, with Ruby on Rails and uh, ASCII Doctor. And, uh, well, what I quickly discovered, <laughs> to my great perplexity, is that... Uh, uh, ASCII doctor used a parser that was based on regular expressions, and of course that's just 
that doesn't hack it. You can't really write a proper parser with regular expressions. So my next attempt was I eventually migrated to a system where I was using Elixir on the back end and various things on the front end, like Angular 1, Angular 2, Angular whatever, whatever, okay? And what I discovered is that no matter what I did is, you know, if, if a, I had only a small amount of code, everything was fine. I could handle that. But as it grew larger, uh, it would reach a state where I could no longer really deal with it. I, if I wanted to make changes, that would propagate to other changes and it, things that I fixed would break other things. And it was just, it was a nightmare. And that's why I looked like this fellow now, okay? So, but I was fairly happy with Elixir on the back end and I realized, okay, that's a functional language. Although I didn't even know what a typed functional language was. So I thought, well, what I really need is a functional language on the front end. So I started looking around, I discovered Elm through some Google search and um, I started playing around with that, and that led to this state of mind, uh, computer bliss, okay? So I've been very, very happy with that, and I'll talk more about why I'm happy with it and why, as a single developer, I've been able to make something that basically works. I, I use it for my own writing. Uh, a few other people use it. And, um, you know, it's about 20,000 lines of code for the compiler that transforms markup to HTML and another 20,000 for, uh, uh, for the app itself. And I'll describe the architecture of that towards the end. So, you know, it's statically typed, it's pure, it's immutable, it's functional, all those good things. And what could lead to more bliss than that? Okay, so um, who needs such a system? So this is not going to ever be a big money maker. Uh, I'd be surprised if it makes any money ever, but uh, you know, Students need it, at least in fields like math, and physics, and chemistry. And uh, teachers who teach those students need it because, you know, as teachers, we like to prepare things for our students. Class notes, problem sets, uh, uh, solutions to the problems, of course. And professors, which are another species of teachers, need it because in addition to doing all of those things for their students, you occasionally will be lucky enough to publish a research article and you have to prepare that. So I actually use this system now to prepare articles that I occasionally submit, they are occasionally uh, accepted. Um, so what can go into a document in this script system? Well, any one of three markup languages, it turns out, my little version of LaTeX, which I call micro LaTeX, uh, a version of Markdown that has, you know, can deal with equations, and my private little language in Clojure, which um, I'm sort of stealing the name from Clojure because it uses, it's, it's, it's syntax is somewhat inspired by Lisp, except I use brackets instead of parentheses. And um, you know, if you haven't seen these things, here is a snippet of code in each. There is some LaTeX and uh, that thing is called a macro. I think of it as a function. Uh, we apply it to an argument, uh, which is enclosed in curly braces, so that makes a section heading. Uh, this is how we make bold text. This is how we make an equation, uh, you know, enclose it in dollar signs, or a displayed equation, so that'll be centered in with space above and below. And, you know, uh, LaTeX actually consists of two parts. There's the, there's the text part, which is all this, and then there's the math part. And you can think of this as a little domain-specific language for writing formulas, like this little macro makes that beautiful S sign for integrals that we all love so much. Most of us do, anyway. Uh, here's the corresponding thing in Markdown. Uh, so it looks just like ordinary Markdown, except that it's got some LaTeX-like elements. And here is the, an example in Enclosure. I'll tell you why I did this in a moment. But the main, there's only one little thing to look at, and that's this. How do I make text bold? Well, I, I think of the languages consisting of uh, text expressions and function expressions. So this is what I think of as a function expression. It has the form left bracket, the name of the function, which is B for bold, the arguments of the function, which in this case is text, and then a closing right bracket. And um, the reason I... I created this little language as I needed a very, very simple test bed for thinking about uh, graceful parsing. 
And uh, it's such a simple language that it made it easy for me to think about that. And, but it turns out that it's as expressive as LaTeX is, and I guess it's because it's mine I prefer, and that's what I do most of my writing in these days. Um, okay, so um, time for a quick demo. So, the important things. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, uh, let me show you that I really can make a PDF file. And I'll, it says, please wait. Uh, I click for PDF, and so there's the PDF file, okay? but we don't really care about that now. Um, if I click on this, it will bring up an interactive table of contents. Like if I go here, there's the, a section of the Gaussian distribution. If I click on this, it goes back to the top. If I click here, it goes to the section on the electron. And let me show you something here. I'm going to uh, click on this formula here. And let's see, I didn't do it. I did two things at once, which is bad. So anyway, what it does is it, um, it let me grab that thing there. I'm going to select the formula. I'm going to do control S and it will highlight the formula on the right. So I can sort of uh, synchronize both from source text to render text and vice versa. And let me show you an elementary version of, uh, you know, doing something that makes, uh, uh, shows you how it can render things very quickly. So I'm just going to type a bunch of stuff. It's nonsense, but the point is it was rendered instantaneously. Okay, let me show you something slightly more dramatic. Uh, let me uh, cut most of this out. And uh, there we go. Oops. Okay, so it's, it rendered that instantaneously, but that's no big deal because there's almost nothing to render. Now I'm going to paste it back in. Three two, one, zero, okay? So it's very, very fast, okay? And this is not a large document, but even with, say, a 20-page document, this is only four pages, it works quite well, okay? So that's sort of the, the main idea. And uh, I think I'm going to skip the graceful parsing business because uh, I talked about that two years ago and we wasted some time with, <laughs> with things here. So... Um, let me go back into the slides, and uh, let's see here, we go back. Very good, okay, so there was the demo. We've done the demo. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Okay, we're, we're okay. So, you know, there are various decisions, decisions that I had to make in the course of doing this. And um, one of them was I decided that uh, I was going to try to parse everything to a common abstract syntax tree. And uh, it's a very simple syntax tree. It's uh, expressed by one type, expression. I'm going to ignore the metadata part. All that does is it locates where the expression comes from in the source text, which you need for all this synchronization business. And there are only three variants, text, fun for function, v fun for verbatim function. And to see what those things mean, uh, there is a little snippet of source text. Uh, and if I parse it, it turns into a list of expressions. There are just three of them. The first one is a function element. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, a function element, the name of the function is i for italic. The body of the function or the argument is Pythagoras, no big deal. The next one is a little piece of text, a text element, says. And the last one is a verbatim function element. The name of the function is math, and the argument is the Pythagorean theorem, or formula, rather. And there's how it gets rendered. Now, if you have just a single AST for all three markup uh, languages, you only need a single rendering function for all three. And, you know, again, as a single developer on a what became a larger project than I had envisaged, this is a labor-saving device. Okay. So uh, to close things up, let me talk a little bit about the system architecture. Um, so uh, there's a diagram of it. And uh, as you can see, there are a bunch of pieces to it. Uh, let's look at the middle row, uh, front end and back end. So this is the Elm plus Lambda part. Lambda is a system that allows me to write Elm on both the front end and the back end and to avoid thinking about databases. I just think about the model for the back end. And the two communicate via WebSocket. So the, uh, it's very, very responsive. It's uh, much better than having a, 
a REST connection via HTTP. Another advantage is that, uh, well, as I said, I don't have to deal with the database, so that's one less thing to think about. And moreover, the, all of the data is contained in memory, so that also makes it very, very fast. Now, in order to give it the functionality that I need, I also use a couple of big JavaScript libraries. Uh, one of them is CodeMirror, that's what I use for the editor. And by the way, if there are any CodeMirror experts here, I'd like to get to know you because I, I've managed to make it do what I need to, but uh, you know, just barely. Uh, the other package is Katek, which fortunately is just a, it's a black box and it does everything that I need. I give it a piece of, of tech and it renders it to HTML. So it's not only a good uh, tech rendering package, but it's ideally suited for functional programming. I had used uh, MathJax before and that has some problems with functional languages. Uh, by the way, in the middle row, the little C refers to the markup to HTML compiler, which can, that contains about half the, the lines of code of the project. The bottom row um, is, are some cloud services, okay? Uh, one thing that I didn't show you, but there's, uh, you know, you, it's good to use images. And um, so if an image is, if you found it by a Google search, you've already got a URL for it, and it's easy to put that into your document. If you create it on your computer, you've got to upload it somehow, and I used to deal with S3, which has just got the worst developer documentation in the world. So um, finally, a, a friend of mine said, well, why don't you use Cloudflare? And uh, it's A, it's very cheap. B, it gives you very good, highly compressed images. And C, their, their documentation is great. So I just made a little, a little mini app inside my app that allows me to upload images to, uh, to Cloudflare. And then this, the PDF server is what I used for what I showed you in the demo. Um, that is a 250 line Haskell program that sits out in the cloud someplace. Uh, so that's the overall architecture. And you know, I must say when I started this, if I had known what I was getting into, I probably wouldn't have done it because uh, it's not just a matter of the compiler. Yeah, yeah, please, please. So I know we are running over time uh, because we had some technical issues. So if somebody wants to run for the keynote, you are excused. Otherwise, we will just continue yeah. for a few minutes more. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm almost finished, actually. So anyway, you know, I, that little C, which uh, is about half the lines of code of the project, that's what I loved the most and what I worked on for a long time. Then I started working on this other stuff. And my goodness, what a lot of work that's been. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, I think that that is it. Ah, oh, help for the single developer. Well, okay, just a couple lines. Why is Elm such a great thing for doing this? Well, it has a good type system that helps you to think about things, okay? Uh, it helps you to document things. I mean, it documents things more or less without having to write documentation. And it's great for refactoring. And this to me is an absolute killer feature because over the long run, you have to refactor. I mean, I can't, remember the number of times I've had to go in and totally rip out some central data structure and redo it. And then after, uh, you know, an hour or a day, everything is working better than it was before. Um, another great saver for me was Lambda because of what I showed you before is that I can deal with one language throughout and it just reduces the cognitive load on my poor little brain. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.